Hello and welcome along to this uh, recording by Dodds Training uh, that will give you an insight into the world of ministers and permanent secretaries, but also that relationship between uh, the politicians who we work with, the ministers, and us as civil servants. Uh, and with us today I've got Caroline Flint. Uh, Caroline, could you introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your experience? Um, hello everybody, um, I'm Caroline Flint. Um, I was a, a Member of Parliament for 22 years and during that time I was a Minister in five uh, government departments, uh, in some of them attending Cabinet. I was also a Shadow Secretary of State um, under David Miliband uh, for five years as well. Um, in terms of my training, I suppose that uh, uh, before I became a Minister, I was on the back benches for six years sat on select committees, I was a parliamentary private secretary, I sat on bill committees. So to a certain extent, I did do an apprenticeship uh, that helped me understand how policy and how legislation is um, delivered and how it's put together, which certainly helped me when I was in the department. Prior to coming into uh, um, parliament, I worked where I was uh, involved in uh, political work and some negotiation work as well. And I also used to work in local government, uh, both for the GLC in Ilia and for Lambeth Council, where I was used to dealing with councillors and delivering for them their policies uh, too. And in a different way, all of those um, experience to a certain extent helped me. But I have to say, being an MP, when you first came into Parliament, we weren't given any real training uh, about the civil service and how it worked. Um, by, not, by Parliament, by the departments, or for that fatter, matter, my political party. And I think there's more that could be done there, Tony. OK. And, and Philip, and turning to you, tell us about your experience and um, what trained into permanent secretaries <laughs> get to lead a department. It's quite, quite well, a large well, job. Yes, it is. And I'll, I'll, I'll maybe start with that as a... Um, the uh, the time when I I, I was a, exist a second perm second in the cabinet office in uh, uh, early 2017 when I got a tap on the shoulder from the then cabinet secretary uh, Jeremy Hayward to say um, uh, Philip I've got a, I've got something to ask you to do I said what's that I said well I know you're second perm second in the cabinet office I like you to go off and be second perm sec in the department for exit in the EU what I said like new job no 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 you want to do this alongside your existing <laughs> job. And then later on, that turned into being full time perm second the department president in the EU. And basically, the answer to your question, I had no training induction. I had some induction by the department, of course, but no formal training. But that by the time that tap on the shoulder came, I'd been a civil servant for something like 28 years, started off in, in Scotland. I had some time in the European Commission. Uh, a variety of, 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 of policy jobs in the Scottish context, uh, worked over the devolution horizon, came down to Whitehall in 2009, worked in the business department, left the civil service never to go back again. For those of your listeners who are, who've, who've gone the same journey, it, it does sort of haul you back because I did go back having gone to the private sector uh, in 2012 um, to work in uh, Nick Clegg's office in the, the coalition, not as a Liberal Democrat, but as a civil servant, so running his civil service office, then became head of something called the UK Governance Group in the Cabinet Office, looking after constitution devolution issues, was essentially head in, in that job of the Scotland Office and the Wales Office um, and the Office of the Advocate General for Scotland, and then took all, all of that with me when I went uh, to work at DEXA as well. So ended up um, after a long career, but as much to my surprise as anybody else's, as the permanent secretary of a department called the Department for Exit in the EU, um, and I left that uh, at the end of March uh, 2019, thereby proving that even if I couldn't organise the exit of the UK from the European Union, I could organise my own exit. <laughs> Excellent, excellent. I should just say that I'm a Director of Development at Dodds and I was a civil servant for 30 years. When I first started in a benefits office, we got six weeks training. So I must admit, training was then. Um, when I moved to the National School of Government, we used to get um, the new fast streamers in, who then got eight days at Sunningdale uh, residential course when they first started, which gave them a 
fantastic grounding, uh, they now get one day's training. So that kind of thing is a, of a concern to people. And I'm just wondering, I'll start with you, Caroline. Um, training for new civil servants, uh, and we're talking not just about policy here, we're talking about people on operational delivery, either in a tax office or a benefit office or something like that. Um, what, how, how important do you think that initial training is for them? And are there any hints and tips of things that you would have liked to have seen in the civil servants who you've met in your career? Mm. I, I think it's really important for anybody who works in public services to have some understanding about politics. Um, you know, as a as an MP for you know over two decades, the amount of times I've heard you know members of the public say, "What has politics got to do with me?" And of course, the home they live in, uh, the the police they call on, the health service they use. When they have to obviously you know use the benefit system or other forms of support local government i mean it's everywhere it's everywhere and it seems to me that if the people working in our public services don't feel confident about understanding that relationship and 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 where politicians fit into it but where they fit into it then it's no wonder that you know people say what has politics got to do with me um so i do think it's important and as a, as a minister, I don't think it's just important for those who are working close to the offices uh, to understand this. Um, it's also important for those on the ground. Let me give you maybe quick two examples. One is, is if the people working at the heart of government do not understand how parliament works and how politicians work, I don't think that that will help them to inform the work they do but also about how to deliver policies through the very complicated um, uh, processes that Parliament um, has in terms of scrutiny and accountability, but also at the end of the day, passing legislation. I think on the ground in a community, as a constituency MP, you know, very often I would have more contact with some of those services. Somebody comes to me and they've had a problem getting their benefits sorted. Someone's had a problem at the hospital or, or what have you. And as a politician, I would be engaging those services to say, what's gone wrong here? Is it a problem? But also, Tony, to understand whether it's a one off or whether there's something bigger in the system that is going wrong, that is affecting other people that I'm unaware of. Um, so I think, again, it, it is important at a local regional level, as well as at the heart of Whitehall, um, that civil servants, wherever they meet, maybe understand the roles of politicians as ministers and MPs nationally and locally, uh, but where politics fits in with the work they do. I, I think that can only be beneficial. Good. And, and Philip, can I ask you the same? Is there something missing in how we're training our civil servants? I, I, I very much agree with Caroline on this, and I think it's, it's the political side, paradoxically, is not given enough emphasis. Of course it's there, and as part of the policy profession or indeed induction as a civil servant, you'll get to understand the workings of parliament, the formality of all of that, how money works, how legislation works, all that sort of stuff will be in there somewhere. Um, but there's too little attention paid to the political dimension. This is what distinguishes uh, being a civil servant from many other sorts of jobs. You're operating in a political context. That's clearly if you're in, in the policy side of things, but it's also true if you're in operational jobs running some of the great services of the state, because these are ultimately under the direction of politicians and you need to understand how those serv services relate to the political process and indeed how the, the, the people using those services relate to the political process. I, I grew up in, a, uh, in, a, in, a, in, in the civil service in, in Scotland, um, and given the, the context in Scotland with politics being a lot more close and personal because of the, the scale of, of the government in Scotland, I was very used to, to living in a, a political milieu, political with a small p, and, and just rubbing shoulders with politicians informally um, and knowing quite a lot about what was going on in the political, that political world. And that informed the way that I worked with ministers, and I think it made me a better civil servant. Coming to Whitehall, um, I have to say, I was a little bit shocked almost 
by just the disconnect. I worked in Victoria Street in the business department, like, you know, stone's throw from Westminster, and it could have been another world. And, and it just didn't, it meant that too often people were putting in PQ answers that missed the point, or the letters that were being written in, in response to inquiries coming into the minister were, were just inappropriate. They, they, you couldn't send them to anybody. It didn't make any, any sort of sense. But just that, that, that being plugged in to that, the vibrancy of the political world, it helps to inform the way um, that you give advice to ministers, develop policy. It's not being political with a big P, mm -hmm. but it's being political with a small P. I loved it. That was a great fun job. And I was sort of surprised that everybody else wasn't in that space, but should be far more emphasis on that. And just one final point, as Caroline says, this is not just about what goes on uh, in that sort of 500 yard radius from number 10. This is about politics locally in the devolved governments, uh, understanding the richness of political life across the UK. At this point in time, more important than ever, the civil servants serving the different governments of the UK understand that nexus. Right, OK. I mean, that raises uh, for me. Uh, and both of you have worked at a, a political level um, locally, nationally and internationally. Um, do you think it's important to know about not all of it, but some of it, you know, and have an awareness and have an interest? in local, national and international. So I'll start with you, Philip, because of your, your DEXO experience and now uh, yeah. that we've left the European Union and your reflections on what you found there, but then through uh, national and also what about Scotland? Is that different? Yeah. So paradoxically, one of the effects of us leaving the EU is that we're going to have to understand the EU a lot better and um, this notion that leaving the EU means we're never going to talk to them and it's just uh, just for the birds this is too important a relationship on all sorts of fronts it's not just about trade and fisheries it's about energy policy security uh, financial service a whole uh, welter of policies where what happens in the EU will impact on what goes on in the UK, whether we have a deal or, or not. And I'm speaking to you just a few hours potentially before we know the answer to that question. So understanding the EU and again, a curiosity about how the EU operates, how French politics work, how German politics work, what's going on in East Central Europe ought to be part of the kit bag for any civil servant, almost in any job, actually. It's just that curiosity. You don't have to know everything. Um, but certainly if you get into a job where you've got that interface, uh, you can't run a fisheries job, for example, without understanding the politics of fisheries in Norway um, or in France or indeed in the Faroe Islands and understanding that broader context. But he, bringing it um, to, the, to the, the UK, since devolution uh, uh, 20 years ago, there is no policy that can be pursued by the UK government in devolved, uh, whether it's devolved or reserved areas, without having some understanding of the impact of those policies in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. It simply makes for really, really poor decision making. If, if you're looking at immigration policy or broadband rollout or innovation policy or security policy, if you have no idea how those policies might go down in the devolved parts of the UK or how the devolved governments might react to those policy concerns. And it, it is frankly, it was a job I had in Whitehall for seven years to try and improve understanding of devolution. And I, it was uphill work and I did not get nearly as far as I'd, I would have liked to have done. There's this is almost innate resistance to thinking about life beyond Whitehall. And if it was, if that was a concern when you had devolved legislatures with their own very extensive powers, how much greater a concern for local government in England, for the Metro mayors and the other levels of governance within England. Um, and of course, there are some brilliant civil servants in Whitehall get all of that, are passionate about it, but there are far too few and far more civil servants need to understand 
how this country functions. And that means getting out there physically, but also emotionally and mentally as well. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, and Caroline, uh, just you could probably empathise with the scene yeah. in um, in the loop where the minister is having to deal with in Washington with American politicians and a possible war in Iraq. And his constituency secretary is on the phone about <laughs> a war falling down on a pensioner. <laughs> Constitu and not that the Americans get it, the American politics. Do you think that British politicians should see things on a different level? Well, I think understanding how other um, uh, political administrations work around the world is really important, actually, because, you know, we're all in politics, but there's lots of different types of politics. I mean, in the UK, I mean, just thinking about the American and, and the UK experience, of course, you know, we have constituencies of around, uh, you know, 78, 80,000 uh, electors. Um, a congressman or woman, you know, we're talking about, you know, 500,000, I think. Um, in that sort of environment, you, you can understand and get why lobbying is so big in America. I mean, it's big in the UK as well, but so many of the people that politicians meet in America are through lobbying organisations and, and groups of one form or another. Um, but for MPs in our British system uh, and for MSPs and others, it's very much still, yes, you do get lobbied by organisations, but it's very up close and personal with your constituents as well. And I've always found that to be uh, a strength uh, because you hear a sort of unvarnished truth from those people when they come and see you. But again, sometimes you have to multitask between being on the phone with your oppo in another part of the world and uh, uh, Mrs Jones from a ward in your constituency has got a problem but they both both involve relationships and relationships building and understanding that other perspective I would just add one thing to what Philip said about learning as well for me in some I can think of some of the policies that I was involved in as a minister I found it enormously helpful and I think my the staff I work with at the did too when um, one of the devolved administration had already embarked on an area of policy and had actually put it into action. And when then we were thinking about how we would scale that up for an England wide uh, policy and smoke, the smoke free legislation is a good example of that. It was enormously helpful to myself and my civil servants to be able to go to Scotland to understand how they'd implemented the policy already to learn what worked and what didn't work to inform our own policy making for doing an initiative like that on a much bigger scale. And likewise, going to other countries and talking to politicians and officials there about how they did it too, enormously important. I sometimes found it when I was on the Public Accounts Committee, still concerning that when we were inquiring into a particular project uh, in Whitehall, we'd often ask the question, what a what what is what are the Scandinavians doing about this? Or what's another part of the world doing with exactly the same problem that we're trying to address here? And I'm afraid sometimes the answers were pretty thin in that it didn't seem that anybody had thought about going to ask the Scandinavians or the Americans or, or another country about how they were tackling this IT problem or this transport problem or whatever it may be, which I think, you know, is a bit daft. I'm a great believer in not reinventing the wheel. And if I was a bird, I would be a magpie. This is what I used to say when I was a minister, Tony, because I had the fortune to be able to go around the country and internationally, hear how other people were trying to solve problems that we were tackling as well, and basically pinch the best ideas and bring it home. There's nothing wrong with that. There is nothing wrong with actually learning from others' success and mistake and trying to inform your own policy. So Steve, I just give you a very light, re, I'll give you a real example of that in best tradition of policy making. When I was working in the business department, the then Secretary of State, Peter Mandelson, was very interested in how you bridge the gap between research, brilliant research in UK universities, and uh, development in, in economic, in, in, in companies in terms of growing good businesses in the UK. And that gap between the two things. And he said, where, where else does this well? So we drew on a lot of experience from in the UK. And they said, go look at the Fraunhofer Institute's 
in Germany because they've done this for 40 years and they do it really, really well. So we hopped on a plane and off we went to Germany with the Secretary of State and we visited Fraunhofer Institutes. We came back, we, we uh, developed the plan, uh, we took it to the Treasury, we got knocked back first time, we got knocked back second time, third time we succeeded and by then I think we we're probably under Vince Cable as Secretary of State. But because it was a good idea, it was well grounded, there was international experience to back it up. Those technology innovation centres are now the catapult centres, still mm -hmm. going strong. And it was just a great example of that good combination, ministers, civil servants working together, seeing the problem, being, being uh, open-minded about where the solution would be, and not being scared of borrowing ideas from somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> excellent. Some excellent points raised there, which I'd like to come back on, but uh, time is quite short. But I'd like to come back on the point about the Public Accounts Committee and uh, civil servants knowing more about Parliament. Um, there's sometimes a disconnect between government and Parliament. You know, that that's them. But in the end, you know, that they, they will scrutinise us, but we are the government. Uh, Caroline, could you give me any thoughts on about um, whether civil servants should know more about Parliament and, you know, should they visit when they when they can? <laughs> oh, absolutely. And I, and I always think it's, I mean, a number of the um, Whitehall departments do have parliamentary units who, you know, are dealing with the day to day, obviously letters from MPs, uh, PQs and, and, and so on. Um, but they also have a role in, in often helping to train up other parts of the department in terms of understanding how Parliament works. Um, and also, you know, when you're doing a briefing, what briefing is going to work best for a minister uh, when they're having to either stand up in the House of Commons or on a or be in front of a select committee or, or um, on a bill committee. I've also encouraged over the years, Tony, um, uh, MPs and ministers uh, supporting civil servants to come and visit us in our parliamentary offices and spend some time shadowing, but also at the constituency level as well. And every time I've um, uh, uh, helped that and facilitated that to happen, um, all the people who've come through that process have found it enormously important to then going back into the department and understanding better uh, the connections and the nature of uh, parliament, but also the roles of MPs to the work they're doing. It's extremely helpful. On the Public Accounts Committee, I was on the Public Accounts Committee for four years. What is great there is that you don't have the ministers in front of you. You have the permanent sex and senior civil servants and those chief execs of the arm's length organisations. Um, obviously, it's supported by the National Audit Office as well. And I look that they have there are look there's theatrical moments at that committee as well as at many others. But because you haven't got the politicians. There's less of the sort of party political point scoring that goes on and maybe some of the grandstanding that occurs elsewhere. But it really is an important part of accountability in a structured way um, to hold the permanent sex and senior officials um, to account and answerable for some of the things that they're overseeing in the department. Um, and, and I think it's one of the best committees, um, I would say that, wouldn't I, uh, that exists. Philip, your reflections on Parliament, <laughs> so, particularly okay. PAC. So the PAC, which I had the pleasure of, uh, of appearing before a couple of times and Caroline was, was on it, a bit of a rite of passage for a new permanent secretary because it's really, uh, or, or a chief executive, it's, uh, uh, you know, when you reach the dizzy heights, that that's when you get the, the great privilege of having to <laughs> explain yourself under that sort of scrutiny. Also select committees, of course, as well. And um, I had appearances in front of the select committee uh, uh, for exiting the EU, which was a, uh, which was some on my own uh, 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 a couple of times once with, with David D Davis as well uh, absolutely right that permanent secretary should be held to account in that way this is very visible now it is very public you're on essentially live television and um, you know that probably about 50 percent of the audience is your own department um, they're virtually rooting for you and you know whether you've done well or not when you get back into the department by the way people are looking and your word gets around very quickly. Um, but this is this is right 
but it does put a stress on those accountability relationships because as a permanent secretary, you are defending the position of the government, but you are being held responsible for that personally in that accountability scenario. And you don't have the option of saying, my advice was actually rather different from this. And yeah. it was the minister who chose to go in that direction. So I think we are we are pulling, we're distorting that whole accountability system at the moment. And it needs some careful thought. I am in favour of accountability for senior public servants. But in return for accountability, uh, I think they should have a greater ability uh, to be more public about the advice that they've given. I think that's a fair trade, if you like. Uh, and I think more realistic in this modern day and age. I don't think ministers should resign for mistakes that civil servants have made. Um, but I don't think civil servants should take the can if ministers have ignored the, the advice or taken a different route. Perfectly acceptable for ministers to ignore civil service advice. But if it turns out civil servants were right, then it seems to me in the accountability stakes, the civil service should be able to uh, to uh, to explain that. Uh, just one final quick point, just to, to wrap this up in terms of the understanding of parliament, parliamentary processes. Um, civil servants far too often forget that this is a game of people talking to each other, communicating. And, you know, some of the briefs I used to see of, of people being given a brief for appearing in front of a committee or, or questions or whatever it is, you can't read that out. And I used to say to civil servants, look, you've written that, now go and read it out in front of a mirror and just listen to yourself and then go and rewrite it in like human speak. Yeah. And it's that real experience that actually when you get the vibrancy of the debate, you know, keep it short, keep it sweet, keep it succinct, and then allow the minister to sort of busk off that, but don't give them four pages of waffle, no good to anybody. And coming back to you on uh, Caroline on that, do you think it's important that uh, policy making is understood at all levels of the civil service. That's the way that policy interacts with ministers, legislation, whether that's needed, the reasoning for the policies. Should people at operational levels understand that? Do you think it'll lead to better decision making? I, th I think it's really important. And I, and I also think those at the heart of the policy making need to understand about those working at the operational level, about whether the policy is going to enable them to do a better job. I mean, um, I, you know, look, you know, one of the things I, I, I pride, proud of, you know, prided myself on as a minister uh, was, you know, if I wanted to ask, if I was once, if I'm delivered a policy, in a presentation, if you don't understand something, ask the question, <laughs> because if I don't understand it, how is somebody else going to understand it down the line in terms of how they're going to implement this? And so much of the policy we develop relies on guidance. Uh, and in many respects, those on the front line having to interpret that policy in the best way they can, whatever that may be, delivering a benefit, arresting someone on the street, whatever it may be. Um, if there isn't that sort of uh, uh, connection and understanding, then something gets lost. And I can tell you, there's many a time when, you know, I've sat down with officials and we've been brainstorming. We've been asked to deliver a policy in a certain area. We've been brainstorming how to do it. And part of our brainstorming would be to try and put ourselves in the, in, in the feet of someone having to deliver that policy on the ground or a member of the public on the receiving end of that policy and then work out what is what could go wrong with this. When you have people interacting with a policy in terms of delivery, it doesn't always go the way at the centre of the Whitehall we expect it to happen. So being your devil's advocate, working out different scenarios of what might go wrong, what would be the obstacles we get, is a really important part of the process. And the people on the operational side, they're using them to sound out on these issues is vital to fundamentally getting the policy right at the end of the day. A huge amount, and I know you'll be aware of this, Tony, because you've been on the front line and, and then come into the centre. Um, from, a, from taking a policy through Parliament and the legislative process, to delivering it on the ground in communities, a huge amount can get lost in translation along the way. And then we end up saying, oh my God, that, that law didn't quite work out the way we thought it was going to work out. So yeah, it's vital, vital. Yeah, yeah I, I can absolutely concur. I, I, just to give an example from my career, but I, I worked, so I looked after schools policy in Scotland for 
four years and we covered a lot of ground with curriculum qualifications teacher pay training uh, additional support needs all sorts of things but i knew i was doing that in connection with those who were actually doing the teaching um, uh, the teachers themselves head teachers the local authorities who were running the educational services the people in the qualifications authority and getting the, 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 the people together who understood the system uh, to inform the way we were thinking about policy. But at the heart of that, actually just going out to schools and mm -hmm. sitting down in classrooms, uh, in the staff room, talking to, to people who, would, who, would, who are teachers, knew more about teaching uh, you know, than I was ever going to do. And it, it did two things. It, it, it instilled a bit of humility in me because they're all my, you know, all of my team, clever, you know, policy ideas. Here were the people who would, who actually were doing this um, and imparting knowledge to, to youngsters. But the other thing was, it was just a great joy because it was you saw the reality of the of the wonderful things that were going on in schools, and it was, it was like, you know, you could have really difficult weeks, and you get you go out to a school on a uh, Friday morning, whatever it was. And it was just uplifting and it would just think this job is so worthwhile because I'm seeing what's going on here. So, again, for all civil servants, whatever they're doing, finding the route to see the reality of their of the policies they're working on and talking to the people who are delivering those policies is is a, is a great is an important part of the job. But it's, it is what it makes it worthwhile, actually, at the end of the day. Excellent, excellent. So one final piece of advice from the two of you on a new civil servant coming into this vast monolith of strange departments all knitted together with strange professions, all knitted together with strange jobs, all knitted together to form this thing. What would you say, Caroline? <clears throat> Um, wow. <laughs> well, I, 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 you know, I think one of the things is, is that it is vast. Um, and, you know, there, if you're not sure about something, always ask um, and be inquiring, be inquisitive. I mean, you know, if you if you don't have that sort of passion um, for the work you're doing, because actually, you know, pub, being public service is an amazing thing to be part of. You're touching people's lives every day. And be inquiring about where you, the work you're doing at that time fits in with everything else is really important. I think for most people in every walk of life, Tony, if you don't know where what you're doing fits into the bigger picture, it can be quite <laughs> depressing. Um, so be inquisitive, find out more. But also, if you're ever in a meeting and you're reading, a, a, you're being have given a presentation or you've been sent a submission and you don't understand it, don't be afraid to say, I don't understand it. Because if you don't understand it, other people won't either. And that doesn't help to do a good job and deliver a good service. Thank you. Philip, that's what uh, Yeah, endless, be endlessly curious is the way. It's exactly what Caroline has said. Be, be, just be interested in what's going on. And through that, understand how your role fits into that wider picture but keep perspective as well and don't let don't let it overwhelm you you're 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 in a big system and actually wherever you are in in that big system it can feel overwhelming at times i tell you you know if you've 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 got all the way up the top of the greasy pole in civil service it still feels very exposed at times and and a bit overwhelming um, but what i what i always had recourse to there was the knowledge that the job i was doing was valuable in terms of public service uh, that I could keep a perspective on it that you know what I was doing was part of a bigger team but then remembering also that you are uh, part of that team and um, building those sort of team links and, and and enjoying those team links and above all just recognize the value of the job uh, that you're paid to do um, in, in terms of supporting people in the country uh, and enjoy it. It's a great, great profession to be in. Well, thank you both for your time today. Uh, it's been excellent, fantastic advice, and I'm sure it'll be beneficial to many, many people. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.